Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's webinar, How to Prove Marketing ROI, Overcoming Digital Marketing Challenges. A little about us, MediaCurrent is the open source expansion partner. We're known for pioneering the playbook on Drupal and we're here to support our client partners and community with deep open source st strategies and guidance on the road to Drupal and successful website projects. And so with that, I'll pass it over to today's presenters. Awesome, thank you, Jesse. Hi, everyone. I am Ali Del Judas Bovi. I'm a digital strategist here at Media Current. I'm really excited to get to chat with you all today about some of the digital marketing challenges we face today around attribution and understanding our audiences. I have a really deep passion for understanding users and data and really using that information to help create the best experiences across a variety of different platforms. So I'm excited to get to dig into some of the ways and tips and tricks of how we can kind of help and overcome those challenges today. Hello everyone, my name is Danielle Bartholomew. I'm a senior digital strategist here at Media Current. Thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about data, marketing, and improving ROI. These are really some of my favorite topics and things I've wrestled through and learned so much about in both my education and experience across a variety of industries and organizations. These aren't easy tasks to tackle, but if you read my quote there, I'm an advocate of taking on big challenges and I'm really excited to talk to you about them today. Hello all, my name is Vicki Walker. I'm also a digital strategist here at Media Current. I have a background in international business and ad strategy and I help our clients build relationships between brands and their customers. We're really excited to talk to you today about building marketing return on investment. Awesome, thanks Vicki. So I'm just gonna kind of go over today's agenda. So today we're gonna start off with just setting the stage on what attribution is. Then we're gonna get talking about what it really means to have the right mindset when it comes to data and how to foster a data-driven culture within your organization. And then we're gonna get into some of the nitty gritty details and specific elements of implementing an attribution strategy, what some of the common challenges are, and then some tips and tricks on how to overcome them. So to start it off, in order to really gain a better understanding of what your marketing ROI is, you need to have a means of measuring success. And we as marketers know this as attribution. So now the impact of attribution can be seen across all facets of your organization. It helps you justify investments through data. So this way you know where and when to make changes or improvements, whether that's to a feature on your website or even a marketing ad. It gives you a better understanding of the customer journey. It helps you to see and understand the intricacies of your customers and where you reach them the most. It also gives you a better allocation of budget and reduces wasted spend. So attribution really allows you to change where you spend your marketing budget and gives you a clear view of what is and isn't working. It helps to create actionable insights. So it allows you to understand which touch point has the greatest impact on your customer's decision to purchase or to take an action. And this helps to understand whether where to further optimize and outline areas of focus. It also helps to increase the quality of your leads, which ultimately leads to increased revenue for your organization. So in all, it really helps marketers make fact-based decisions, gain efficiencies, and really realize what all of those greater returns on marketing investments. But as we marketers know, attribution is hard, and we'll talk about some of these challenges throughout our presentation. Here's a glimpse into some of the things you're likely facing. Buy-in and alignment. So not only do you need buy-in from the organization, you need alignment across all departments. Everyone could agree that attribution is good, but with different definitions across departments of what it looks like, you're going to face some discrepancies. Tying metrics to those business objectives. So the challenges here are twofold. It's both the increasing number of data points available to measure and then also the challenge of not really always getting actionable goals within your organization. And then something that we marketers are very familiar with is that bad data. So most organizations are faced with less than ideal data. Perhaps it's inaccurate, maybe it's just complete or completely siloed. So identifying and filling those, those gaps can be difficult. And then the complex journey with multiple touch points. The decision-making process consumers go through is more complex than ever, and it's really only getting more complicated. So attributing to the increasing number of touch points makes it ever more challenging. And then cost. While cost can be reduced through open source technologies like Google Analytics, Data Studio, and even pairing your solution with open source CMSs like Drupal, attribution can still be costly in terms of people, outsourcing for skills you don't have on your team, 
and various things like that. And then also aligning metrics across varying technology platforms. So if you're using multiple channels, which you know you likely are, we all are, attribution measurements look different across different platforms. So Facebook measures differently than Google Analytics. So now I'm going to hand it over to Danielle, where she's going to really dive into what the right mindset is and why it's important for your organization. Thanks, Sally. We're going to spend the majority of our time today walking through tangible challenges that you may have or are most likely experiencing right now. Before we do that, I'd like to address some potential underlying factors and foundational perspectives to consider as we talk about attribution improving ROI. All of the actions you, your colleagues, and your organization take must be based on the foundation of the right mindset to best set you up for success. Over the next few slides, I'm going to chat about how having an infinite and agile mindset can help you better adapt to shifting internal and external factors, how critical a culture of being data-driven truly is, and then the importance of applying your unique ability to critically think through your strategy for your organization. First up, having an infinite mindset. The concept of an infinite mindset has become more popular as of late thanks to Simon Sinek's new book, The Infinite Game, although the perspective of business and leadership is certainly not new. If you aren't familiar with the concept, essentially there are two ways to approach strategy, with a finite or an infinite mindset. Finite strategy is about winning and losing, when, which then will end um, the strategy that we're working on. Infinite strategies, on the other hand, are designed to keep you playing for, you guessed it, an infinite amount of time. Applying this to your data strategy, to attribution, to proving marketing ROI, it means that we should embrace the mentality of always getting better, always innovating, always learning. This mindset aligns directly with agile methodology. If you aren't ready for a full-blown attribution strategy, you can start small and still be successful. In my role at Media Current, I have the pleasure of working with several fantastic clients, one of which is a small organization in the healthcare industry. And while they really want a robust data strategy, they have a lot of hurdles to jump before they get there. Rather than waiting until the stars align or just giving up hope altogether, we are baby stepping forward. They have created a spreadsheet they update manually week over week to track how their performance across a variety of data points are trending. We've identified a few website data points to be used in this executive spreadsheet to track one element of marketing efforts. From there, we've built a very simple data visualization dashboard to help our contact who is still learning Google Analytics how to easily pull the data he needs quickly. In a matter of a week, we had defined initial KPIs and had implemented some solutions to make data collection easier. We took some small, simple steps, and this month we have a better understanding of marketing's role in their organizational goals than we did a month ago. The plans for the future include data processing refinement, stronger data visualization, more automation, but we're gonna continue to baby step to get there. As a marketer in this marketplace, we are constantly adjusting to shifting landscapes. Things change so quickly. This year has been a model example of this reality. With a finite mindset, these changes challenge our model and can cause us all to fail. We have to choose to fix our approach to accommodate or we need to accept that with the changes our approach um, will become obsolete and be another data process with little value. But with having an infinite mindset, these changes become opportunities. We are always evolving and looking to the future so we can leverage these changes to create value rather than creating risk. Next up, the importance of culture. According to a report Gartner published in 2019, culture and data literacy are the top two roadblocks for data and analytics leaders and being able to truly make data work for your organization. In a survey of business intelligence professionals this year, data-driven culture was identified by respondents as the third most important trend rising from fifth last year. So what this means is if you spend time in the world of data and attribution, you're going to continue to hear about uh, having a data-driven culture. 
and it's important for so many reasons. The value of data has to be understood by employees at every level in order to invest appropriately into the execution of the strategy, to leverage the data for decisions, and to add deeper meaning to the data that you're collecting. So let's look at invest in your data strategy. We'll talk more about this later, but a strong data strategy can be costly in time, resources, potential hard costs. If data isn't valued, having the support to invest what's necessary to create an impactful strategy is next to impossible. Leveraging the data. Decisions are made at every level, every day. Fueling these decisions with actionable data is how you make your data work for you. You can have all of the data, but if it isn't informing decisions, what value does it really have? Enrich the data. All insight from your organization, from customer engagements, industry insight, advertising results. There's insight in every corner that can lead that can shed new light and meaning on the data you have, making it richer, more tangible, and more valuable. Proving ROI isn't about throwing all of the data around to show numbers. A data-driven culture should not be interpreted as blindly following just numbers. It should encourage the advancement of data interpretation skills and critical thinking. Fostering this data-driven culture is a long-term strategy and requires consistent effort. The best strategy I've seen used to shift the tides in valuing data is simply consistently bringing it into the conversation. For example, when you're determining placements for an upcoming advertising campaign, one of the points of conversation should be looking at how the previous ones performed to inform your decisions moving forward. If you're in a leadership role, encourage your team to back all of their recommendations and their decisions with any of the data that they have and model the same behavior to them. As you back more decisions with data, start talking about the outcomes of those decisions. As my marketing professor used to always tell me, repetition builds conviction. With the sheer amount of data available to us, it is so easy to dilute the power and story of it. The mindset you need to have going into an attribution strategy is one of refinement and critical thinking. In some cases, most cases, showing more data can actually be more troublesome than showing less. It isn't about how much data you have, it's about what data you have, how well that data tells the story of your performance and what insight it gives you to improve your business. In other words, what is the role of your data in your organization's success? To best use data to communicate ROI, you need to understand that role. A high level directive such as use analytics wherever possible is it's just not enough. You have to define how you plan to use analytics to create business advantage and then execute. Is your data gonna help you create new growth or improve revenue? Will it help you cut costs and advertising spend ways? Will it improve customer satisfaction? Understand the role of data in your organization. Without a clear cross-functional consensus on that role, people in teams and entire departments could go off on their own. There could be a lot of activity, but very little sustained benefit and little chance of a cumulative positive impact. This requires a level of critical thinking applied to your data as you navigate the possibilities and the gray areas of data. That layer of critical thinking on top of your data program is a multiplier on the value of your investment. And that covers the right mindset portion of our webinar. Um, Vicki's gonna take it away on implementing an attribution strategy. Thank you, Danielle. Now that we understand the importance of attribution and a data-driven approach to proving marketing ROI, let's dive into my favorite part, execution. Before planning a route to get somewhere, you have to define where you're going first. Implementing an attribution strategy can be broken down into a few key steps we'll cover over the course of this presentation. Establishing goals and KPIs, mapping out customer touch points, centralizing your data, analyzing that data, and optimizing your strategy. Let's chat first about establishing goals and KPIs. 
Goals are critical to achieving success. If you don't set goals, you can't claim whether you achieved that success or not. Sounds simple, yeah? But we all know that choosing goals, that's a tricky part. If you're starting from scratch, it can feel intimidating to set a goal without knowing whether it's realistic or not. What if I don't meet it? Will that look bad? Does that mean I failed? But as Danielle said, it's about having an infinite mindset. Making a goal is just one measurement tool that you'll refine again and again as you learn more about your business, your customers, and the levers you can pull to achieve greater success. So take the plunge. As the famous American author and motivational speaker Zig Ziglar once said, a goal properly set is halfway reached. So how do we go about picking a goal anyway? Start at your end business objectives and work backward. When beginning a conversation about attribution, you should always start with a conversation about organizational goals. Marketing exists to help further the vision and mission of your organization. All of our goals should align in some way to organizational goals. Easier and said than done though. Oftentimes the biggest challenge I face is trying to determine strong marketing goals based on weak or unactionable organizational goals or perhaps no goals at all. If you find yourself in the same boat, try this. Ask yourself, what is at the heart of this goal? What does the organization really want to accomplish? Think broadly, brand awareness, lead generation, lead nurturing or conversions, retention, repeat sales. Once you know the broad category of the goal, list out all of the potential KPIs that align with that category. Now use this as a short list of KPIs. Once you have a short list, it'll be easier to define the final list of KPIs that you should be tracking. If you aren't given any goals at all, it's important to align on a few. I like to list out what I think the goals are and then get confirmation from leadership or the stakeholders above me. Once there is alignment on goals, you can go through the same process with assigning KPIs. Let's walk through a couple of examples. Let's say you want to increase revenue by 2% year over year. What increases revenue at your company? Selling product, signups, sales leads? Let's say revenue at your business is leads that come through your website. You look at the data and see that all the people who submit leads on your site, 12% of them end up completing the lead process. This would be your lead conversion rate. Looking at those numbers, you determine that increasing leads by 10% year over year would get you to that 2% increase in revenue goal. Here's another example. Let's say your organization's goal is to market your product to a brand new audience. Your marketing goal could be to serve at least 100,000 ad impressions to this new target audience by the end of Q3. Your KPIs would be the number of impressions served to that new audience, the click-through rate and new user sessions to determine how many of these folks visited your site as a result of your ads. Note that any marketing or ad campaign doesn't stop there. You'll want to continue tracking those new sessions to determine how many users ultimately completed the action that equals revenue to your business, whether that's leads or product sales or signups. You'll need this data to calculate ROI of your ad and marketing efforts so you can optimize them as time goes on. Let's talk about some challenges you may face when trying marketing objectives to overall business objectives. You say, I know the organizational goals, but I'm having a hard time tying them to what we're able to do in marketing, or your organization goals don't seem particularly actionable, or you don't have defined organizational goals at all. Start with asking yourself, what's the purpose of this goal? brand awareness, lead generation, revenue, and then collaborate with leadership to define how marketing can best serve the organization. Or maybe you're at the other end of the spectrum. There's so much data. How do I choose the most important metrics out of all of these for KPIs? Our approach is to choose some metrics that seem to clearly align with business goals and choose some metrics to keep an eye on. Put them in the dashboard along with those KPIs so you can monitor them easily and then evolve your strategy over time if you see that those, one of those metrics that you were watching really seems to close, most closely align with your business goals, you can choose that as your new KPI and evolve over time. I think we've all seen instances where a data strategy gets implemented and people chug along with it for years. This can make us a bit apprehensive about making decisions like what metrics will be KPIs for an entire business. So I wanna remind you about the infinite mindset again. It's okay to be unsure, especially at first. It's okay to choose a few metrics as KPIs, watch a few others you're curious about, and change your strategy as you learn more over time. This process is infinitely better than having no metrics to track at all. 
Awesome. Thanks for that, Vicki. So I'm really excited to get to discuss the customer journey element of attribution. As someone who's really invested in user research, this hits home for me and I could probably talk about it for a full hour. But in order to better understand the nuances that come with that modern customer journey today, it's really important to understand where we started. So in past years, reaching and communicating with different audiences and markets used to be more direct and one way. Maybe you'd see an advertisement on the television or even in the newspaper, and the steps the customer took were not only more linear, but they were easier to understand and evaluate. So take buying a car, for example. So back in the day, you may have asked friends and family their opinion, looked at the models that they were driving, maybe you visited, then visited a car showroom, you sat down with the salesman to ask questions, maybe you test drove a few models, and then you ultimately you purchased. And the internet wasn't even part of that process. So moving on to now, it's even more complex and intricate. We've seen how the digital landscape of customer journeys and touch points has grown over time. And understanding all of these customer interactions across, across each touch point is still one of our biggest challenges as marketers. There's more stages, even after purchase, and the steps involve multiple channels, from social media to your website, email, advertising. It can get to be overwhelming. There's even more of a need to be a constant, to have a constant feel across different channels and interactions. And that customer journey is also going to be different and dependent upon different users' problems. Depending on what the problem the user is trying to solve for is going to determine the different steps they take, the different channels that they're spending the most time on. There are so many different channels to monitor, measure, determine what's important to track. It can really, really be hard to cut. It's really hard to take a step back and look at the big, big picture. So let's dive into some of the challenges we face uh, with understanding that customer journey. So diving into some of the challenges. So the internet has vastly changed how users search for products. Where do I even start? If you don't have a baseline of what to pull from in terms of your own web and marketing data, industry best practices is a good place to start. Look at the common industry trends and see where most of your users are. And then by doing also some user testing, you're going to be able to confirm or deny some of that industry research because it's going to be specific for your particular organization. Another approach is to think about what steps you can take internally to better understand users. So for one of the clients we're working with today, we're doing kind of an in-depth look at how users are using their internal search to better make improvements on the content strategy and communicate value of their customer portal. So moving on to the other challenge. So how do I create a sustainable plan to track customer touch points? Really, the biggest way is just start small with something that's more defined like your sales journey. By looking at the typical sales journey for your organization, you're going to begin to be able to build out what definitive steps a customer takes. So for example, for one of our higher ed clients that specializes in professional education, we have enhanced e-commerce set up for them in Google Analytics. So in order to do this, we had to evaluate the process users went through to purchase a course, a funnel was then set up to mimic that process so we could understand the conversion rate of each step and then use that as a tool for optimization. And then also through some recent user tests, we've been able to uncover another nuance that's given us opportunity to really refine our data. So it's okay to start small. It doesn't have to be pick up and run. It's not gonna, you're not gonna be able to figure it out by tomorrow. It's a iterate and process uh, as you go. And then my users are everywhere. How do I know which channel to focus on mapping out touch points for? So tie this back to an organizational goal. So if you want to build brand awareness, like Vicki had mentioned earlier, ask yourself which channel is going to give me the most ROI, say impressions to measure, and ultimately achieve that goal. Maybe it's Facebook ads, Google ads. By tying this back to an organizational goal, you're able to zone in on what's most important. And then this is also an area where you can do user testing. Talk to your users and customers. Find out where they tend to find your product or service. How do they typically search? What are some of their key motivators? You know, what are some of their purchasing tendencies? By understanding the user journey and tracking those customer touch points, uh, it's really going to help to involve and get input from all departments. Your organization also may benefit from doing a journey mapping ex exercise that focuses on brainstorming using particular words that represent key customer concerns. So for instance, maybe it's the quality, maybe it's the security, maybe it's the speed. So at the end of the day, remember to ask questions and always be curious because the digital landscape is really always evolving. So now let's move on to another key element in the process of attribution, which is centralizing data. Now this can get really complicated really, really quickly. So we're going to kind of go over some high level things on how you can get started. So to succeed in the data space, we know that companies need data that's properly defined, relevant to the tasks at hand, 
structured in a way that makes it easy to find and understand, and also of high enough quality that it can be trusted. It also helps if some of that data is proprietary, meaning that you have sole ownership or access to it. But for most companies, data is a real problem. So that data is scattered in silos, maybe it's stuck in departmental systems that don't talk well with one another, the quality is poor, and maybe this, the associated costs are also high. Bad data also makes it nearly impossible to become data-driven, and it adds enormous uncertainty to technological progress, including machine learning and digitization. Centralizing your data helps to give you a global vision of your customers, empower your analytics to gain a 360 degree view of your ecosystem, and it helps to determine customer and account level profitability. So let's jump into three popular approaches. So like I mentioned before, discussing data centralization quickly goes to the deep end. So you're probably just gonna scratch the surface. There's multiple ways to do it, depending on the data you have access to and the information within each data set. So make sure to do your research in determining what to do. An easy entry level solution is to integrate your data from one source into another. This isn't an ideal way to centralize data, but it can be relevant if a data silo would benefit another process or data set, like ads into Salesforce. But that doesn't fully solve the challenge of fragmented data. It's just less fragmented. So to really achieve the benefits I mentioned before, you'll need to move into conversations of what joining and blending data would look like for your organization. So joining data is just combining two databases where one data set is combined into another. So think of commonality, so two Excel files. Blending is a little bit of a more flexible approach, but more work goes into preparing these data sets. This is where a new database, say a data warehouse, extracts data from different sources and aggregates it into a new data set. So for example, suppose you have transactional data stored in Salesforce and quota data stored in Excel workbook. The data you want to combine is stored in different databases, and then the granularity of that data is captured in each table, and it's different in two data sources, so data blending is the best way to combine this data. Now, I know this kind of gets into the weeds, but don't get too overwhelmed. Let's jump into some of the challenges that come with streamlining your data processes and how you can start to overcome those today. So challenge number one, I have data from a ton of different sources. What does this mean? This may also mean that your data isn't consistent also across data sets. So inventory it. What data points are the same across sources? What tools can you input new data points to allow to join them? It's going to be hard to centralize if you don't first know what exists and where. It's also helpful to understand what data is important. So ask yourself, what data is needed to help solve my specific problem? What data do I need access to in order to achieve my goals? And then how do I know if my data is accurate? For example, if you're auditing your GA data in Google Analytics, we often use Chrome extensions like Google Analytics and Google Tag Manager Bugger, Tag Assist, or Data Slayer. And then if you're comfortable in dev tools, even using the network tab allows you to see the data being sent to your analytics tool like Google Analytics. So consistently auditing your data and configurations and gut checking this is gonna help you to keep up to date with knowing if your data is accurate. And then how do I help my leadership easily understand our progress against our goals? One thing that it's always hard to field is questions from leadership on what's working, what's the progress of this, what's the status. So really start with questions. What's gonna be most important for leadership to have access to know in order to understand that progress? For example, how many sales qualified leads versus marketing qualified leads? What's the percentage of new visitors versus returning visitors to the site? Utilizing a data visualization tool helps to connect the dots and give a high level overview of that progress. So, for example, for one of our clients, we built an executive dashboard that helps to gauge the overall health of the website. So their stakeholder is able to use this to justify any new features or items they need extra budget for. It helps them to quantify their progress with their leadership team. So maybe your challenge is also just not knowing where to start. It's, it's okay to start small. It's okay to take those baby steps. Google Data Studio has a blending option even to get you started. And you don't have to get there tomorrow. Take small steps, celebrate the wins when you can, and try not to get too overwhelmed. Think about maybe, you know, do two similarly similar data sets that you can blend. Perhaps you're using custom dimensions and analytics to push a unique ID from your CRM or SSO into your data. Start for an easy win and then start exploring solutions for other data sources. Now I'm gonna hand it over to Vicki to get into the nitty gritty around capturing and analyzing your data. Thanks, Allie. So one third of industry professionals highlight that the right technologies for data collection and analysis are essential for better understanding their customers. So what's the right way to accomplish this? 
Let's take a quick look. Ensuring you capture the right data is a critical first step, but data only becomes useful once you're able to assign attribution, perform analyses, and then use what you learn to make changes to your business strategy and approach. Let's first chat about attribution modeling. One formidable challenge in capturing and analyzing data is understanding how to assign attribution. I feel like if all of you had your microphones on, I would have heard a collective groan just now. <laughs> attribution is both a data challenge and a marketing challenge. We could have an entire day seminar on attribution modeling alone. We don't have that kind of time today, so let's briefly chat about some challenges and how we might go about solving them. The CXL Institute has an excellent blog post about attribution modeling that we'll link to, uh, to the webinar attachments at the end of this presentation. Marketing attribution, according to Wikipedia, is the process of identifying a set of user actions, like events or touch points, that contribute in some manner to a desired outcome, and then assigning a value to each of these events. In other words, it's a way of remedying that old advertising quote, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted, the trouble is I don't know which half. <laughs> Just a few things that might be on your mind. How do I know which attribution model is right for my organization? I don't even know how to assign attribution in the first place. I'd say forget about everything you've heard about attribution modeling for a moment and go back to your goals. What will the outputs on your attribution model mean? What will you do with this information? Your goals will determine how complicated your attribution model actually is. Each attribution model has pros and cons. After defining your goals, align the business goals across your organization to try and get a holistic view of what each data point means to the success of the organization as a whole. Do leads from certain channels end up being more impactful for your business in the long run? Do you feel the last touch point a customer had with your business was more impactful than the first or the second? Do you think ads are more impactful for your business than non-advertising efforts? There are many different models, so you'll have to weigh them in relation to your organization's goals, abilities, needs, and beliefs. Data analysis is a skill like any other. If you haven't done a lot of this in your career thus far, don't be surprised if you struggle with deriving actionable insights from even the cleanest and most comprehensive data. If you find yourself lacking the skills you need to get what you want out of your data, and assuming you're not planning on hiring a data analyst anytime soon, use the resources available to you to level up your data literacy. Google has excellent free classes on how to use analytics, use business intelligence software to do some of the heavy lifting for you, or if you partner with an agency like MediaCurrent, have them train you on what to look for and how, to, how they analyze your organization's data. If you know how to analyze data but are strapped for time, automate as much of the process as possible so only, the only thing left is drawing conclusions and translating that into action items. There are many data integrations that will port your data directly into reporting tools or dashboards that automatically update on a set cadence into helpful charts of the specific metrics that mean most to your business. I'm a big believer in automation. Let the computers do what computers do best and the humans do what humans do best. And lastly, a way to analyze how you're performing against your KPIs is to create a scorecard. Scorecards, dashboards, and worksheets come in all shapes and sizes. But the bottom line is that you're focused on the specific KPIs that best demonstrate ROI of each channel. We'll share a spreadsheet after this presentation that helps with the calculations for this particular example, but this simple chart can be created in other tools. Creating a scorecard requires more work up front, despite its simple appearance, as defining these figures and formulas for your business takes some brain power and buy-in. But once you've created it, it gives you an easy, at-a-glance ability to analyze performance per channel. Using this information will enable you to optimize your performance. Danielle, walk us through what that process looks like. Thank you, Vicki. On to our last section. Optimization is the execution stage where the infinite mindset really, really thrives. It's asking yourself, how can we do better? What's the next data point we want to capture? How can we better visualize our data? The stage is the one that gives me peace of mind knowing that I don't have to do everything all at once, that I can continue to build out a roadmap and build on my data strategy over time as I learn more and have more capacity to implement the things that I'm learning. Let's dive in. 
there is not a one size fits all approach to optimization. You really, really need to add a layer of critical thinking to your data strategy, your current position within the execution of that strategy, the data you're currently collecting, and the nuances of your business and any external variables impacting your business. Now this slide covers some questions you can ask yourself to prompt a variety of optimizations. And these are questions that I regularly ask myself as I'm working with clients to determine what's next. If we pick out a couple of them, um, I love talking to the sales team um, to better understand how marketing is performing from their perspective. What are they learning about the, the leads that they're getting from marketing? Um, how, it, how can data help improve their ability to close the sales that they're working on? Um, being able to be not only having your data centralized and not siloed in different departments, making sure that you're able to collaborate cross-functionally will give you ideas of how to optimize and level up your data strategy. When you have situations come up where maybe your marketing budget has increased or maybe it's decreased or maybe the cost of advertising on certain platforms that you're used to has, has changed, being able to evaluate what has worked in the past by having your data set up to show the value of your efforts on these different channels helps you better make those decisions um, and gives you an opportunity to, um, to be confident in those decisions. I also love to be able to look at previous wins that we've had or previous, even previous losses that we've had on various advertising campaigns, um, user testing, any, any place where you can have A-B testing to know how to improve in the future. This isn't an all-encompassing list, but it's a great place to get your mind going. On to the next one, leaning, our, leaning on our infinite mindset. We often approach optimization with a cyclical approach. We look at the data we have, how we're tracking and understanding the value our marketing efforts are making. What areas of opportunity stand out? Are there any areas of risk that we need to mitigate and examine? Any new insight you've captured that has evolved our understanding of our audiences, market position, or our data strategy? Begin to prioritize those potential improvements and then test and analyze your tests. Understand what's working and what needs to be adjusted before it goes live. Once you're confident in the tests, make the formal changes that um, and start embracing that new data and then start the cycle again. That's optimization. I'm going to hand it to Vicki for the key takeaways of our conversation today. So what we'd like to impart today is adopt an infinite mindset, foster a data-driven culture, establish goals and KPIs first to know what return you're measuring in the first place, evolve your understanding of your audience and map their journeys, centralize your data to tell a stronger story of return on investment, and optimizing your data and analysis approach to further establish data as a competitive advantage. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll pause now to, have, to take any questions you have about marketing return on investment. We do have some questions that have come in um, from the audience, but feel free to continue submitting questions and we'll cover as many as we can in our time left. Um, so the first one, is what recommendations do you have to overcome the challenge of alignment across an organization? Okay, I'll take that one, Jesse. Um, so kind of a good place to start is scheduling weekly touch points uh, with different departments and use those touch points to educate the team on the importance of attribution and how they contrib can contribute to making it work. So start with questions, uh, start with having conversations with your entire department team, uh, and use that time to align on the KPIs that are being tracked in order to gain better alignment and see a better visual from a big picture holistic aspect um, of how to get alignment across those departments. Thank you, Ali. Um, another question that came in, can you share a few types of attribution models to consider and a little about those?
I could speak to that, Jesse. So um, attribution models are all based on business logic models. There are things like last click attribution, where you give whatever the last touch point in your marketing mix 100% of the credit for that conversion. There is last click ads attribution, where you give whatever the last ad that a customer interacted with 100% of the credit. First click, whatever the first interaction was. Linear attribution, where you take all of your marketing channels and evenly give credit to each one. And then time decay attribution, where you give the newest touch points more weight than ones that are older. You'll notice that um, these are all kind of philosophical beliefs <laughs> as a business and not necessarily a hard rule as to which ones are more important. So encourage you to look at your business, look at the performance of each channel and determine which, like how, if recency plays a factor in the return on investment for the channels you have in play, if some channels seem to be more valuable to your business and others from a return on investment standpoint, um, critically look at the data you have and then just talk with your leadership and people at your company to determine what you feel as a business is most like carries the most weight to you ultimately to decide which attribution model is best for you. You can read more about that in the CXL Institute blog post I mentioned earlier that we'll include in the attachments packet for this presentation. Thank you, Vicki. Um, another one we had, what tips do you have on how to track attribution to an entire account, not just a specific lead or contact? I'll take this one. Um, so how to do that really depends on what tool you are using. Um, different tools allow you to track activity at say the lead level, um, but then also being able to pull it and roll it up into um, more of an account uh, level. If you are using Google Analytics, um, there are ways that you can pull in and create your own, say, custom dimensions or custom metrics that you can enrich your data. Um, I'm actually working with a, a client right now who um, they're working with a group of accounting firms. So with the information that they have from their single sign-on, they pull the firm name into Google Analytics, so they can see it both at the, the user level or the account person, um, but then they can also roll that data up and look at it from uh, the account level and even um, broader than that, the practice area. So I would really utilize, if you have key pieces of information um, that you can access about your, uh, about your users and your leads, Explore the tools functionality and even explore what Ali was talking about um, for data centralization on how to pull all of those pieces together um, to enrich the data and, and give you a new ways to kind of slice and dice the information to better understand um, how it's performing from different angles. Thank you. Um, one other question. Can you give an example of a method used to track activity for different touch points? Um, I'll actually jump in. Um, I'm Jesse. I, I'm the marketing manager here at Media Current, um, and I, I manage a lot of our campaigns, so have some experience in this area. So in the, in the presentation, we mentioned Salesforce, um, and that's something that we use here. Um, Salesforce uses campaigns to track activity for leads and contacts. Um, so as the contact has different touch points, um, as far as, you know, this could be webinars, uh, down, you know, downloading an ebook, attending a trade show, um, visiting a page on your website, filling out a form. Um, so what we do is we create campaigns for all of these different channels that we're using. Um, and then in Salesforce, we can tie any activity that is happening. So if, if a specific contact attends a webinar, we can tie them to the um, campaign that we created for that webinar and mark them with a status of registered. Um, so there's a lot of automations that you can 
put in place to make sure that you're um, tying everything to those campaigns and you know all of this activity will then allow everything to be tracked back to the contacts um, which you know eventually get tied to the accounts and attributed to the return on investment for any opportunities that are created. One other question we have, um, do you have any creative, effective ways to use to communicate results, share trends, um, set samples of data visualization for sales teams? I'll take this one. So one of my favorite ways to do this is to build out um, data visualization within Google Data Studio. It's pretty simple to spin up um, dashboards for unique use cases. Um, so that's the tool that I like to use. And as far as being able to communicate it to a specific team, I always try to start having a conversation with them first to see what it is that they're interested if there's a specific metric or do they have any questions about user behavior in a certain way um, and use that to guide my um, guide my design of the dashboard and what metrics I include. The thing that typically gets the most attention from um, whether I'm working internally with our team at Media Current um, or if I'm working with our clients is utilizing different different filters so you can see the data by um, using the the client i mentioned a minute ago um, using filters so i can filter all of the metrics based on the firm that they belong to or um, i can filter it based on the the acquisition source um, that helps to better understand the different trends being able to filter it by those key areas um, you know, when you see something standing out, then you can dig into it a little bit more. Um, if you are wanting to go a little bit further advanced, um, being able to create custom fields in Data Studio is also really helpful. So um, pulling in, you know, those custom dimensions or custom variables, or merging data together within Data Studio, um, that's kind of the next level way to leverage your data and really impress the people that you're working on or working with. Okay. So another question, can you still set goals and KPIs even though the data source sources aren't quite ready for reporting? What's the best way to report without the data, if at all? What about platform provided channel analytics? <laughs> Jesse, and then if Daniel and Vicky have anything to add, uh, they're more than welcome to. But um, as far as setting goals and KPIs without the data sources, what I would do is think through what data sources you actually have access to to begin with. And then from there, figure out how you can set KPIs within that data. Um, I would go ahead and set goals and KPIs before even anything. Setting organizational goals would probably be the first step. And then from there, assigning KPIs that could measure those uh, organizational goals. As far as if you have the data sources available for that, I would probably align, go ahead first to align your KPIs to what data you have available. Um, and then as far as reporting, um, think about what, your reporting doesn't have to be super robust from the very get-go. I would probably say think about simple is better, whether that is within something like Google Analytics with a free dashboard that they have, um, or um, really starting with what questions is gonna help. So what questions are you trying to solve for and answer? Um, and then platform provided channel analytics. I think it's okay to note um, what analytics that platform um, is reporting on, but I would also note how they measure that data. So for instance, Salesforce is gonna measure differently than Google, Facebook's gonna measure a little bit differently as well. So think about the channels and how they specifically measure. Maybe they use sample data, things like that. And when you're reporting on those types of things or using those analytics numbers, just make sure to report um, any discrepancies or things that might have caused the numbers to be that way. 
I totally agree, Allie. Um, and I think it's important that here, here's the infinite mindset again, <laughs> but it's important to recognize that you might be starting uh, from zero. You might not have tracked anything in the past. And so as Ali just mentioned, think critically about what things you'd like to track, what KPIs you think might be important to the business, set up your set yourself up for success and starting to track, and then being able to measure that success over time. You might not have a lot to work with if you're starting fresh, you've never set up any kind of tracking, you don't have any data to work with. You're just gonna have to use your knowledge about the business and the goals of the organization to try to guess, like just make an educated guess about where you're headed, start to track those things, and then prove that over time. Great addition, Vicki. I have one quick thing to also add. Um, not having data points, but having buy-in that that data would be helpful has been one of my strongest levers to get more investment into the data that we do have. So if it's a matter of, you don't have the data because you haven't been given the, the bandwidth or the resources or um, whatever you need to get that data. Um, being able to communicate how you would get it, what is the cost, what's the investment, what insight is it going to give us um, might be a, an approach that you can take as you're, you're building up your data. And we'll end with one last question. How can you attribute non-click marketing activity like TV versus broker? This is, this is tough. It's definitely easier to align channels with similar metrics to have an apples to apples comparison on how each channel is performing in order to more easily nail down what attribution works for your business, but it's not impossible. Having things like UTM parameters, vanity URLs, or even things like um, promo codes or asking people, let's say you're trying to get people to call in on the phone and, and using a special promo code over the phone to try to track if you're to try to track what, how those people are eventually connecting with your business. Because maybe the channel, obviously, like a commercial on TV or you know, in, on, a, on display through a network are not going to click directly on the ad, but obviously the intent is that they will be influenced to interact with your business. So to try to tie those two actions together with UTM parameters, with vanity URLs, with promo codes and that sort of thing is, is one approach to try to bring that data into your business to track return on investment. Um, another way is if you're, for instance, going to start a TV campaign to look and create benchmarks for your business before the campaign and have that as a level and then measure the lift after your business, after the campaign finishes or during the campaign. And if there's in try, obviously, within your marketing mix to only to have that be the only variable. So keep all of your other marketing channels consistent, have just the one the TV campaign, for instance, as the um, as the difference within a certain time period, then you can measure before the campaign, during and after to see if you have a lift in your business and make some conclusions there is another approach. Great, thank you, Vicki. Well, that wraps up our questions for the presentation and brings us to the end of the webinar. Thanks to our speakers, Danielle, Ali, and Vicki. We hope you can join us for upcoming Media Current webinars. Please visit our website at mediacurrent.com to find out more.